first I want to thank everyone for joining us for the Alabama program in sport communication women in sports communication panel definitely a mouthful. We find ourselves in very strange times and times when we are unable to be together in person to have these conversations. So we wanted to make sure the dialogue continued and subsequently we are bringing this panel to you virtually. No big surprise there. So thanks for joining us and thank you to our fabulous panelists for joining me tonight to record this. My name is Dr. Kim Bissell and I'm the Southern Progress Endowed Professor in Magazine Journalism and the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Communication Education and Information Sciences at the University of Alabama. I'm also a faculty fellow in the Alabama program in sport communication. So what we're going to do is I'm going to give a very brief introduction to each of our panelists, but I've asked each of them to give us a slightly longer intro about who they are, what they do, how long they've been doing it, and maybe even how they got started. So joining us from the University of Florida, where my daughter just got started as a freshman, is Dr. Roxanne Kosh, the Associate Director of Sports Journalism and Communication, and an Assistant Professor in the Debar Department of Telecommunication jumping literally all the way across the country into the state of Washington is Dr. Chingru Shu, an assistant professor of mass communication at Eastern Washington. And then continuing our zigzag into the state of Texas, we have Dr. Natalie Brown Devlin, an assistant professor of advertising and public relations. And then we have Dr. Nikki Lewis joining us from the University of Kentucky, where she's an assistant professor in the College of Communication and Information. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Jennifer Harker, an assistant professor of strategic communication in the Reed College of Media at West Virginia University. So one of the things all these women have in common is their research broadly in the area of sports communication. So that's going to be the focus of our panel today, diving into the work that they do, how their work has potentially changed or evolved as we find ourselves in a time with little to or no live televised sports. And they're going to talk to us about some of the challenges and maybe successes that they've had as women scholars in the area of sports. So before we get into these questions, can you each tell us a little bit about who you are, what you research specifically, and how you got interested? Roxanne, can you start us off? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Kim. Uh, so Roxanne Kosh, I am actually from France originally, born and raised in France. Uh, I've been in the U.S. for 10 years now, uh, as of this summer. Uh, well, actually, I spent one year in Mexico, so nine years in the U.S., but in North America for 10 years. Uh, in France, I was a sports producer and reporter for mostly television. I was freelance um, by choice, and my main employer was Eurosport, which, which is basically the European ESPN. And so I covered international events, national events uh, mostly uh, from a lot of tennis. So I did uh, three of the four Grand Slam tournaments. I'm missing Wimbledon uh, mostly because we didn't have the rights to Wimbledon. Uh, and so that obviously has an effect on whether you cover uh, the tournament or not. And I really wanted to come to the US or uh, Canada, but mostly the US. And, and so I ended up in a PhD program at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, I was there for three years and, uh, and I got into research that way. And so I research uh, mostly social issues in sports, uh, a lot of you know, gender issues in sports and not a lot about media related to media, but not necessarily. I've done some work related to uh, how Mexican Americans use soccer to, uh, to get uh, acclimated to American culture and, and things like that. So it, it sometimes uh, kind of bleeds into sports sociology. Excellent, thank you. Chingru? Uh, hi, I'm Chingru. Um, so I, I, I now I'm, I'm at the universe, at Eastern Washington University. I'm a system professor. So last year I just um, graduated from University of Alabama and this is my first year still as a faculty member because our semester, our quarter, you know, new academic year hasn't started. So I still count this is my first year as a faculty member. So um, this is my seventh year uh, in the United States. 
So I came to the United States for my master's and then go to Alabama for my PhD and now I, at Washington. So what I'm doing is um, primarily is about sports and gender. So Dr. Um, Kochi, I cited your work a lot. So you, you, you were, you know, one of the authors that I read your papers a lot when I was a master's student, when I started my career in sports communication. So I'm very happy to see you in person. <laughs> so that's um, pretty much about me. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Natalie? Yeah, so I am Natalie Brown Devlin. Um, I got started in sports communication research during my doctoral studies also at the University of Alabama, so roll tide. Um, so what my research specialty is in is kind of at the intersection of sports fandom, crisis communication, and digital media. So um, I graduated with my PhD in 2014. Um, I worked in the advertising industry for a few years as an analyst, and then now I'm teaching at the University of Texas at Austin in their advertising program. So, glad to be here. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Continuing our tour of SEC schools, Nikki. Hi. Um, my name's Nikki. I uh, started working in sports communication as a sports producer at the NBC affiliate in Cincinnati, Ohio after undergrad. And I also worked in public access television for a while, helping people make their version of Wayne's World is kind of what I call, called that job, was kind of teaching production to folks. So um, I really enjoyed the work. I love working in the industry, but I decided to go back to get my master's. I thought I'd go back and be a news director or something with a master's degree. And then I realized that you could study this stuff for a living. And I was um, really excited about the fact that I could get paid to ask research questions and then answer them. So I went from making media to asking questions about it and got my PhD at Indiana in 2015, spent three years at the University of Miami and or got scared away by a hurricane and really missed my family and a job came up at Kentucky. And so um, I've been here, this is my third year at the University of Kentucky. Um, broadly, my research interests are the psychology of, of media consumption, especially in sports and entertainment. Um, so I'm interested in kind of user characteristics or audience characteristics, media characteristics or attributes, and then kind of the context in which we consume media. And in the sports domain, uh, sports fanship drives a lot of that research and basically kind of media consumption habits um, as it relates to sports media. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Perfect. Jennifer. Hello, thank you for having me. It's um, great to be here amongst such stellar company. Um, so as you mentioned, I am an assistant professor of strategic communication at the Reed College of Media at West Virginia University, which is a lot to say. I, like Roxanne, earned my doctorate at UNC Chapel Hill. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I was never at a lack of um, sport-related crises at UNC, so um, that's where I truly developed my um, research program, which bumps right up against Natalie's. I have cited her at nauseum in my work, so, um, and proud to do so, <laughs> I might add. Um, but my research actually started during my master's program, earning a communication master's degree in um, West Texas University. And um, I really fell in love with the whole rhetorical side of crisis communication related to sport. Then that kind of um, morphed and changed my time at UNC into more um, looking at stakeholder perceptions and fan behavior related to sport related crisis. And um, I often take the social network analysis approach in my work, and my side passion is related to how I originally started in media um, and media studies and sport communication, and that was as a practicing journalist. Um, and I had a real passion for investigative journalism before I moved into trade journalism and PR and marketing communication. So it all kind of links together 
Um, in my day job teaching at the university, I get to run a student-run advertising and public relations agency, and that is very rewarding. Um, and then I get to teach research and writing and all that good stuff on the side as well. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so, as you well know, we're finding ourselves in this very unusual and almost surreal situation where all types of sports from little league to professional came to an abrupt halt back in the spring. We no longer had the ability to flip on ESPN or the SEC ne network and watch sporting events. I found myself watching Bundesliga over the summer and my daughter would come in and she was like, what are you watching? And I'm like, I need sports. Just <laughs> let me have my moment. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about how, if at all, um, this, this shift and this pandemic has maybe affected your research um, and maybe address how you see this as a potential opportunity for researchers moving forward. And this is very open and up and anyone who wants to answer can answer. I'll go. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so um, this is kind of a two-pronged uh, answer for me. So when I first hear how has the pandemic affected your research, honestly, the first thing that comes to my head is my kid's daycare was closed. So I had to figure out a whole new way to work. My work days were cut on a good day in half especially since March. Um, my in-laws are here with us now, so yeah, I have child care for the first time in like six months. Um, so that's the first thing that comes into my mind, but it also, the things that are happening right now and the absence of sport is something that we can't ignore in our actual research either, and particularly in what I, um, my research area, something that particularly struck a chord with me this summer is um, when the NFL social media team kind of worked with NFL players to force the league to come out and make an official statement, particularly Roger Goodell, on the Black Lives Matter movement. And so that got me to thinking how within crisis communication, now internal stakeholders like athletes are actually trying to use the public domain via social media to influence decision making at the organizational level. We're also seeing the same thing with college athletes trying to influence their leagues to allow them to play their sports this fall. So that's kind of something that I'm trying to take a look at in my own research right now. Um, I can I can follow up with that as well. Um, and then those are all excellent points, Natalie, because when I was thinking about um, it's kind of it's kind of when you first get hit with it, it's just what are the immediate needs that must be assessed at this moment? Like, how am I going to finish my classes? How am I going to do these things? And the first thing that happened to me uh, with my research was I got a, um, a journal uh, review back. And it said, why are you not addressing COVID-19 in the discussion section? And to me, I was like, I wrote that paper three months ago. Why would I deal with COVID-19? And I wasn't even ready to integrate the ramifications or the implications of COVID-19 into my previously collected data and research. And then um, thinking about moving ahead with research, in my mind, for so long, I've been pushing this argument that being a sports fan is very similar to following a religion. And the best way and easiest way to enact that is by uh, watching live sporting events with one another. And I'm really interested in audience behavior and there was no audience behavior occurring. And so um, I had to kind of shift the way that I approached audience analysis to thinking about what people are doing instead or what they're not doing because live sports are at such a premium and so limited. So I kind of had to reframe the way that I approached the work. Um, those were kind of two of the biggest um, things that stick out for me. Certainly. I think for me, my work, it didn't take a 180 necessarily, but but certainly 90 degrees at least, uh, where I, I kind of, um, so we were facing this, right? But I, I was like, well, we're not the only ones facing COVID. COVID, the people, you know, in the media industry are facing it as well. And so I kind of um, took the opportunity to go toward that more. So uh, with my wonderful doctoral student, we wrote a scholarly commentary about the effects of COVID on sports production. So there's one thing that 
uh, it's called it's called the Remi uh, Remi model, where it's basically remote production. Um, so if you know if you look at current sports productions right now, sports broadcasts right now, uh, a lot of them are done remotely. So it used to be you know you had a truck right outside the stadium, everyone was in that truck. With social distancing guidelines, that's pretty much impossible. The Remi model, the remote model, has existed for years. Um, you know, the first time it was kind of tested at a big scale was for the 96 Olympics in Atlanta. Uh, so it's existed for years, but it's it's been a very slow integration, uh, kind of diffusion of innovations theory. If you, you know, look at that, we were kind of still in the like early, uh, like the, the first part of the of the curve. And all of a sudden, we're like at the end almost because of COVID, right? Um, so I'm kind of... Uh, I guess switching gears a little bit to go more toward like, hey, let's help the practitioners. Let's actually try to really bridge that gap between uh, academia and the professional industry. Uh, we've been, you know, as I said, most of my research so far has had to do with social issues and especially gender issues. We've been documenting that for close to 50 years now. Um, we know what's going on. We know that we've identified the problems, but it's time to really look for solutions and try to uh, talk to practitioners and, and, and try to find solutions together. So uh, that's kind of what I'm doing at this moment. Great. Okay, so, so for me, you know, the, the, during this COVID period, so I think the hardest thing for me is you know, we are, you know, after the spring um, break, you know, our school is all online, you know, at, until, you know, I think our plan is for before the end of the year, end of this year, we will all go online. So literally, I work at home alone. So it's very hard to get myself, get motivated, you know, to work, you know, because I really like, you know, come to school, you know, get that routine, teach and do research. I, I like that life better. So for this COVID period, it's just, look, it's, it's very, everything is, it's very hard to get motivated and it's very hard. And I miss talking with people, you know, talking with my colleagues and getting inspired with each other. So, but it's everything, you know, is so different, you know, during this COVID issue, you know, I, I think that is kind of my biggest concern for my research, hard to get motivated. And also I, I see this COVID thing, you know, this has brought a very, very different context for sports, like Olympics. So they, they postponed, <clears throat> the the Tokyo Olympics. I, I I I think this this is very 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 rare. Didn't happen. Uh, so and now they are planning to do that next year. You know, Japan is really you know they insist uh, on doing that. I they are very commitment they, commitment to the Olympic thing. But, but you know, people have different opinions. So I think that is something now. It's really you know catch my eyes. I really want to do a research about the Olympics of, uh, in Japan, how they will do that, how, how they deal with this that, um, COVID and Olympic issue. I, I'm still searching for an angle to look at that issue, but I think it's, it's for a sports scholar, for a, um, an Olympic, you know, specific scholar, I am really get, I, I'm really interested in the scenario out there, yes. Certainly. So for me, COVID has been um, uh, also a childcare issue. I have older children. My children aren't toddlers anymore, but they sure um, they sure do know when I'm trying to write. And they sure do need something right then. <laughs> so, you know, that's something that we've worked on since March and we still have not solved. So. Um, taking any and all advice there. But, you know, other than um, the need and yearning to focus on work and then being a little bit unable to do so between the interruptions with family, but also because I'm just such a news junkie and it's been so hard to look away. 
And so the overconsumption of media has really taken up a lot of brain space for me. And I've had to really work through that. So I'm just saying that to normalize it for all of us. Um, but as far as work and research goes, I'm currently writing a textbook with um, Timothy Coombs on strategic sport communication. And so a lot of my focus, when I can focus, is there, because it has to be. Um, but I did have the good fortune of being invited onto a research team of scholars from across our country um, on you know, the racial injustice matters and um, Black Lives Black Lives Matter movements and what athletes and teams and leagues are doing, um, you know, in that space right now. And, um, you know, we cannot talk about this time of COVID and the disruption of sport without, um, you know, in some ways celebrating that we've all had to take pause and that we are having to deal with things that we should have dealt with, well, frankly, centuries ago, right? Um, so it's an exciting time in sport communication right now. Um, it's a time of reckoning um, that is long overdue. And I just can't imagine a more exciting time to be a sport communication researcher than right now, as difficult it is, as it is to keep up. Well, you know, I think you've all made just fascinating comments about this. And um, one of the things that I've been trying to do just to fill my time now that I've sent a kiddo off to college is um, I'm listening, I find myself listening to podcasts because I'm walking the dog. The dog's like, seriously, I don't want to go on the 20th walk today. And I'm like, let's go. <laughs> um, but I'm listening to podcasts from um, professional athletes. And you think about say runners who ran the Olympic trials on February 29th and you qualify to run in the marathon in seemingly a couple of months. Well, I mean, as it is with all sports, but definitely in running, you know, you like you time your, your training to peak at certain times. And now it's like, whew, got to wait an entire year. So, I mean, I've actually been thinking about doing something that I've never really done, but sort of looking specifically at how COVID has affected athletes in terms of training. And, you know, you hear about athletes who have had loss and, you know, who have had COVID themselves and all these different kind of, you know, facets associated with that. And um, as Jennifer was saying, like, it, it's hard for me to not be a news junkie and turn, turn it away. So I'm always on Twitter looking at stuff. Um, but that's definitely something that I, I thought would be fascinating. Um, shifting gears just a little bit. I don't know about you all, <laughs> but you know, I've, what I've heard you all say is that professionally you worked in the industry, you worked in news, you worked in sports, you worked in, in PR. Um, I was a former sports journalist, sports photographer. Now it was a long time ago, but at that time I found myself as the only female, you know, the only female photographer on the field, on the sidelines, in the, you know, in the sports area and all that sort of stuff. And I definitely felt like an imposter. And then we shift and kind of fast forward into academia wanting to work in sports communication. And I feel like there have been many times where I still feel like I'm experiencing imposter syndrome. And I've been doing this for 20 years and I still feel that way. So is that something that you could address if any of you felt that way? Maybe I'm alone on my little imposter island, but. You're all alone, Kim. No. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I couldn't very uh, well be. <laughs> <laughs> no, imposter syndrome is real for me, uh, and I think for a lot of us. Uh, I think part part of it for me as well is you know, being in uh, SEC country and and hearing about American football constantly, which which is not a sport that I I grew up with. Um, I, I like to call it fake football in front of my students just to piss them off a little bit. Uh, <laughs> That's but, gone over really well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I can't wait to do that in front of Alabama students someday. Uh, <laughs> but no, I think, um, so that, that, that definitely I think uh, is also causing my imposter syndrome sometimes because I don't know American football as much as, as frankly most Americans. 
but that doesn't mean I have, a, you know, I don't have other things to bring to the table, obviously. Uh, but sometimes getting, you know, through that and, and to be fair, that's also a, a feeling that might happen in the professional industry as you, as you kind of hinted at. Uh, the, the biggest one for me, and that was real football uh, with soccer, which, which is my favorite sport and I grew up playing it and uh, which is highly unusual for a wom woman of my age in France for the record. But um, I, when I covered the 2014 World Cup in, in Brazil, um, for the first time, uh, I felt imposter syndrome, mostly because, as you said, I was just, I realized I was surrounded by men. And I was active in the professional industry, mostly from um, 2007 to 2010 in France. Um, and somehow I always had at least one woman around me. But in Brazil, I was alone. <laughs> and and that was, that was weird. Um, as far as fighting it, I mean, for me, uh, it's really talking to my friends and family and just talking it out. And, and uh, you know, that helps me a lot, just mentally speaking to like, oh, yeah, you're, you know, they, they kind of reassure me once in a while. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right. I guess I'm not as bad as I think I am <laughs> or things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think that this is uh, imposter syndrome is honestly one of the number one, maybe the number one, or at least one of the top things that I struggle with too. Um, and one of the ways that I've honestly addressed it is in a similar way, talking about it and naming those feelings and um, realizing that my negative self-talk is not doing me any favors. Um, and also having other strong um, female academics who are in my department who I can talk to and who tell me that they feel the same way. And I'm like, how could you possibly feel that way? You're amazing. And they're like, how could you feel that way? You're amazing. <laughs> and so having that moment. Um, but also, this is a conversation that now that I have on the very first day every semester of my doctoral seminars, um, I think that. Um, it's important to name right up front for graduate students um, that everyone is in that room because they are smart, they are intelligent, and they have something to bring to this class. Um, and so don't let the intimidation of imposter syndrome stop you from participating. And so I think that the key to it is really just naming the feelings in the classroom space or with colleagues to help work through it. But I mean, I'm still trying to work through it, if I'm being honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can um, chime in here as well. So to second and third, some of the thoughts there from uh, being the only woman in sports when you're working in, say, production or something like that. Um, yeah, a lot of lessons learned that actually made me, I think, a stronger individual about what I'm willing to tolerate and what I'm not. And, um, you know, those, those um, gray areas that um, change over time, right? The, the, what we're willing to tolerate has changed dramatically in the last uh, even five, 10, of course, 20 years. But um, having a network of people that are protective of you, um, whether they're friends, family, or colleagues, um, find your champions and hold on to them no matter where they are um, and, and talk to them about, about, you know, things you're going through just to get out of your own head and get a, a kind of a sounding board. And, um, you know, outside of working in the industry and working in academia, um, sports is a very um, protected cultural language by a lot of people, um, especially, um, you know, undergraduate students, you know, and it's, it's kind of a, a currency to them. Um, there's a very strong pride of knowing sports minutia and trivia and facts and being an instructor to those students early on in my career was very intimidating because as some of you have mentioned, I don't know everything about sports all the time in every arena, nor do I have time to become an expert in every sporting angle, attribute, um, whatever it might be. And I kind of came to the point where um, I realized everybody has their own passions and not everybody knows everything about everything. And so as Natalie does on day one, especially for undergraduates that are taking my class that aren't sports fans, I don't want them to do poorly because they don't know who played third base for the Yankees in 1972. I, so I walk in day one saying, hey, 
It's okay if you're not a fan. It's okay if you don't know a lot. We're gonna connect larger concepts to the areas in which you are comfortable exploring. If you're a fan of cricket, if you're a fan of field hockey, it doesn't matter. Let's talk about concepts and then you choose where it applies. And just kind of lowering that gate, those boundaries has been really helpful. Um, in talking to students after they've taken the class, a lot of them have admitted, you know, I wasn't a fan when I came in of sports. I was intimidated by the fact that I wouldn't know anything, but the fact that it's not, you know, all about trivia and who knows what, um, is, is just a good way to kind of I break the ice, I guess. That's all great. Um, for me, you know, I feel this imposter syndrome is, it seems it has been with me like uh, always after I come to the United States, you know, part of that, I think it's because I'm, you know, a foreigner, you know, so I, 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 I don't know the I until now I don't know the US culture the sports sports culture very well so that's one another is doing sports you know the the many many you know the majority of the editors you know the scholars in this field are 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 male you know definitely all all the sports male scholars I have met they are all very very nice but I I, I just you know, sometimes it's it's hard. It's hard to break the ice. The, the pressure, you know, the mental pressure. So, so I think it takes some more effort for a woman, for a woman female scholar to get blend in. Definitely need more, more effort, more uh, more work. But um, you know, interestingly, I didn't feel this imposter syndrome at Alabama. You know, as strong as I was a master's student in Georgia. So, because when I was in Georgia, Georgia has a great um, communication program, but their program is very ad and PR focused. So, I, I think I, I, when I was there, I think I was the only um, graduate student who were doing sports communication. So, I, I, I had a strong fading of that syndrome at that time. But you know, the good thing is I moved to University of Alabama. You know, we have a lot of networks, a lot of scholars are doing sports communication. And I, I, I'm so surprised, Dr. Basil, you said you, you have this syndrome all the time. How can you have this syndrome all the time? <laughs> you know, you were, you were, although, you know, um, I, I didn't take your class, but you are still, you know, as a female sports communication scholar in our department, you, you, you kind of, you know, you are, you, you, you are the person, you know, who can, you know, comfort me a little, somehow. I, I, I just, I just feel in that way, Very you know, and I was, <laughs> yeah. And also, you know, we have Dr. Greer, you know, Jennifer Greer. She she was not there, but she, I, I talked with her, you know, sometimes so I, when I have a question, I talked with her. So this all, you know, at University of Alabama, I feel I, I get a good support, good, very, very good support. And also, although my co my cohort are majority are male, they are doing sports communication, but you know, you having some people are doing similar field with you, you know, no matter if they're male and female, it's such a privilege, I feel, in that environment. I think it's the network is really, really important to try to build a network that who can support you. <laughs> so imposter syndrome for me has always been something that I have dealt with um, because I come from a very non-traditional educational background to now be at this level in the and being an educator now myself. So I have had to tell myself that I do belong. Um, and I tell my other students, my, my own students, that they do belong as well. And the reason why is because sometimes we need to just take a step back and understand that we are a culmination of all of our lived experiences mm -hmm. and our past experiences shape our ideas that come to light for us and our research that we conduct. And so for that, um, for that matter alone, we belong. For example, Roxanne has amazing pictures of attending championship games in France. Um, 
And I mean, that is her jam. I could not write a piece on international soccer to save my life right now. I couldn't because it's not my jam. And that is okay. And like Nikki was saying, we don't have to know all the things all the time. And it's okay to admit when we don't. Um, but let's do celebrate our own, you know, niche areas that we are experts in and embrace that and share that with the world. Well, and to kind of um, hit back on points that some of you were making earlier, it's not just imposter syndrome in sport communication. I think it's in academia. And when I said, you know, I've been doing it for 20 years and I still feel like an imposter. Um, I do have amazing colleagues and I did work with Jennifer Greer for a number of years and she is a phenomenal, phenomenal resource. So I think many of the things that you all have said, you know, finding your people, whomever they may be, finding your people is essential. Um, and, and I think, you know, I guess, I guess for me, when I started off like out of undergrad and I was a sports photographer, uh, I, I've always kind of navigated this space where I was the only female, um, you know, and I, I came into the job at the University of Alabama and I was the only female. Now they didn't treat me that way. So I very quickly learned okay, it doesn't have to be like I'm the token gender, you know, female assistant professor in the department. It, and in like finding that space, I know that not everyone is as fortunate to have a good space like that. Um, but I think, you know, finding your people and finding the network and finding that support team without a doubt is, is essential because maybe, maybe it'll subside some. Um, but I think I always, you know, and I don't know if it's me or if it's, you know, women in general, I'm always saying, you know, could I be doing more? You know what I mean? Like, could I be doing more? I should be doing more. It's the, it's the mom thing, like the mom guilt. Maybe that's what it is. You know, <laughs> maybe it's the mom guilt carrying over into the professional arena. Um, I think I always feel like I could be doing more and I should be doing more. And I look to my male colleagues who are all phenomenally successful and it makes me feel like uh, I definitely can be doing more. Um, but maybe we'll start to... to make strides in that because I think Natalie your suggestion about you know what you say to your students I mean that's that's an excellent way to make them all feel like they they have a, a place there and a space there so um what I would like to do is sort of end this on a high note potentially and um ask you all to share tips or suggestions that you would have for graduate students who might want to work in sport communication or new assistant professors who are just getting their research, research programs going. Like looking back, what would you tell yourself five years ago or 10 years ago and what advice would you give to others? And hopefully my internet won't go out. <laughs> uh, I guess I'll start. Uh, I would say, number one, not everyone is made for an R1 university, and that is perfectly fine. Uh, I graduated with my PhD in 2013. Uh, I've taught at four different universities since, um, in counting UF, and um, I was first uh, in Mexico as a visiting professor, then I was in Georgia. Um, the, the state, not the country, uh, and as a lecturer, uh, so five, five load, teaching load, uh, no research. And then I was at the University of Memphis as an assistant professor, three, three load. Uh, it's a tier two school, hoping to get an R1, uh, the R1 within the next couple of years, I think is their goal. And, and now I'm at UF. And so I've kind of experienced those different types of universities. Um, and I can 100% say that, uh, you know, one is not better than the other. It's just completely different jobs is what it is. And so you have to find what you like 
and and not wanting to go to an R1. I have one of my doc students right now at UF who, I mean, we figured out that's not what they want to do. They don't want to be at an R1, but it's difficult when you're in a PhD program like the one at UF because that's kind of what people expect from you. Um, but I, I feel like that's that's wrong of of elite PhD institutions to do that to their students. Uh, so so that's you know for me the number one advice piece of advice. I was extremely happy at the University of Memphis on a three three load at a tier two school. It is one of my best experiences uh, in my life. I just realized this week that I am not probably not going to go to Memphis throughout 2020 and it broke my heart. Uh, that's how attached I've become to to the, the institution and, and the city uh, in just three short years there. So as far as restarting uh, a research pro or starting a research program, uh, I just restarted one at UF because at Memphis, I kind of went on the creative side where I actually produced and directed a documentary that had nothing to do with sports. Um, so I think... In terms of restarting uh, or starting a, re a research program, those uh, things that you see online where you have a, you know, a table where you, you, you have you know, ideas, just to keep track of what you're doing, ideas, uh, you know, IRB, uh, what is it after that, like data collection, data analysis, writing and revision, or things like that, like trying to keep track of everything that's going on. Um, will be extremely helpful. I just did one for the first time in my life during the pandemic, actually, uh, because I was like, okay, I, I figured out my classes for spring, but now I have no idea what my research is because everything's at the office and I don't want to go there because I'm lazy. So I, I, I'm just going to have to like figure it out here. Um, and so do, doing one of those tables is, is extremely uh, helpful. And, and, you know, even though you might have an niche or niche. I, I can't figure out how Americans pronounce that. Uh, I hear both. Uh, <laughs> but even though you may have one, it doesn't have to be super small. Like you can have a bigger thing. I think, I mean, as I said, my research is kind of, you know, bleeds into sports sociology, but I'm also going toward the practitioner side now. I think as long as you can make an argument for yourself, I mean, I teach on the, you know, I teach practical skills. I teach sports reporting, sports production, sports branding, like very practical skills to a lot of undergrad students for the most part, but also some master, pro masters. And so, it, you know, doing that research may not be part of my original research agenda, but at the same time, it directly affects my teaching um, because it allows me to actually keep in touch with what's going on despite the pandemic and all that, or in the middle of the pandemic. And so as long as you can make an argument for it, just don't be afraid to go for it. Just go for it. If that's something that you want to do, if you can have like some kind of a little argument to include in your tenure packet, just go for it. Yeah, that's, that's a great suggestion. Yeah, I think my advice for this question would be similar to the imposter syndrome advice that just find your people. Um, for me, the biggest game changer um, in my professional life was meeting Andrew Billings in the second year of my uh, doctoral program in Alabama. Um, I remember the first meeting I ever had with him. Uh, well, actually, I remember the day he was hired. Our admin at the time, Diane Shattuck, said, we just hired you a dissertation chair. And I was like, cool. <laughs> Um, and so I was assigned to be his RA and, um, I looked at his CV before going in there and was incredibly intimidated. And then naturally he's like the warmest, kindest person ever. And so I'm immediately comforted, but he hands me his status document and kind of like you're talking about Roxanne. And I just see all of these research topics of things that look freaking fun. And I said probably a little bit too enthusiastically, like, can I work on all of these? And he was like, maybe just one or two to start out with. Let's see. Um, but I think that speaks to a lot of finding a professor and a mentor who gets you excited about the work and about the research and also who will hold you accountable. Um, for doctoral students, find that professor who's willing to meet with you once a week or once every two weeks or once a month, depending on what their role on your committee will eventually be. 
Um, choose your independent studies wisely. Um, always try, find that professor who's going to walk you through just how academia works. I mean, how do you handle an R&R? &R? How do you write a revision letter? All of these things, it helps to have a coach to keep the sports mentors alive. Um, and then now on the tenure track, um, I just finished my third year review this last year. And what's helped me is having, again, knowing my people and having um, associate and full professors who will just tell me like it is. My tenure mentor at UT is Matt Easton. And every time I meet with him, I have really concrete advice of what am I doing well? What are, where do I need to improve? Um, he also, when I'm having those extreme moments of imposter syndrome, talks me down um, between him and Kate Founders at UT. Uh, they help me out in that regard. But again, it's finding the people who can help you just navigate the process, um, who can tell you what those expectations are and help you establish those smaller goals that will eventually get you to the larger one, which is tenure. So, That's good. Totally. Yeah, um, really interesting kind of hearing and, and being able to commiserate with everybody on this panel about similar, I mean, even, um, you know, no matter what direction you take, a lot of these processes that we're going through are very similar. And, um, you know, whether you go industry or whether you go academia or however you decide to approach your career, uh, the one good thing I think that's happening, or there's a lot of good things happening, but one good thing that I think is happening is sports as a as an area of study are becoming more and more respected. And, you know, I came up under, you know, Walter Gantz and um, a few of the kind of old school sports com guys that were having a very difficult time getting published in the mid 80s and the early 90s. Um, and to getting, basically getting taken seriously because sports was kind of this like toy box where um, as, as you know, a practice, as, as a field of study, um, it really wasn't, uh, you know, given a lot of respect. And I think we're coming out of our shell in amazing and interesting ways. And the way that I'm actually seeing it on the ground floor and what I would encourage anybody that's going to the research side to do is I'm in a department where I'm pretty much the only um, sports comm scholar. Now we're hiring a lot more and we're building a program, but what's interesting is that people in crisis communication, people in organizational communication, people in mass media communication are coming to me because they want to study sports. And those natural collaborations that build from people who have been trained in different ways, in different kind of um, sub-disciplines of the comm field, um, can apply all of the great stuff that they know and they've learned into the sports domain. And so sports as a place of study and as an interesting um, content area uh, allows itself to really interesting and natural collaborations that make it easy to be productive. Not, you know, it's not, you know, the golden goose, but having those conversations with your colleagues that may have never worked in sports before um, you can kind of start to build collaborations over time. And that's what I'm kind of seeing here at Kentucky is I'm collaborating with faculty members that I never thought we have interest, common interests in. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as sports as kind of an emerging and, and um, newly established uh, field of study that is worth taking seriously. And um, to second Roxanne's point, uh, Foster your students and your, um, you know, your research collaborators or, or industry collaborators in whatever direction that they seek. Because if you're not doing what you at least like, it's a chore. And I'm not saying you have to love what you do 24 hours a day, but if you don't at least like it, sometimes it's going to be hard to be productive and hard to be successful. So find those interest areas that, um, you know, keep you motivated at least some of the time. And that just makes, you know, a little bit easier to push forward. Totally. Okay, so I, because I just graduated last year, so I think I can give some suggestions to PhD students who can who who just start their like uh, research or something research in sports communication or other areas. So the thing, the the the, the, the first thing. Um, would be, you know, definitely find a good advisor, you know, who can meet you regularly, like walk you through the process. That's definitely important. So another thing I, I would say is use, take the coursework as a chance to build your research. 
So you, you are not really just forfeiting. You know, this professor wants to, me to do this. So I, I will gather something there and, be, and do a final project there to pass this class. I, 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 I think the better way is you have your own agenda and you use, you take advantage of the, you, the coursework to build your research tree. So sometimes, you know, when I was a PhD student, um, the professor, maybe he or she wants us to do this thing, but I, I, I would go to negotiate with my professor. I said, I, 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 I want to do that thing. So I, I still remember, you know, I was in Dr. Horsley's class. She, wants, uh, she wanted us to do a IRB in qualitative research. So I said, no, Dr. Horsley, I really, really want to do a textual anal analysis. I want to give you a full paper instead of just a, an IRB, you know, application, a proposal. Could I do that? So I talked with her and she gave me the permission and I, I wrote a full paper there and it got published. So I really feel it's to um, talk with the professors, you know, I, I, I feel professors want their course to help you the most. So if you feel, you know, in, in that way, you could be a bad, you could get better, you could get more from that class. I will not hesitate to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, uh, I feel finish one project is much, much important than starting a project. So sometimes, I get one project down in two in two classes. So maybe in one class I just write a proposal. In another class I will say I'll, I will work with this proposal, finish it. So I, I I really want my project to get finished. I don't want to you know just to get a proposal and abandon it. I want to get it finished. Find a good place for my project and then start a new one. So that, I, I feel that is important. And also the last thing I want to say is, um, as a new PhD graduate student, so I, I would say at the very early of your like uh, graduate studies, don't give yourself a too high bar, you know? So I, 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 I know some of my, you know, friends, they are very, very smart. But they have they set a very very high bar for themselves at the beginning. So that really, you know, that pursuit of perfection really gives them a lot of frustrated frustration. I'll say so. So they they, they get tam intimidated to, to writing to do their research. So I will say, you know, at the very beginning, maybe your first one or two publications, it's the, the most important thing is to walk through the process to see how a project is conducted, how a paper is published, is published, is published. So I, I feel, you know, that is more important. So don't let the pursuit of um, perfection really make you constantly get frustrated. So, yes. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that one of the most important things for all of us to remember, no matter what stage we're in, I'm sorry if you can hear my puppy. She's having some separation anxiety right now. Because <laughs> if it's not the human daughters, the canine daughters, I really am sorry. Back to what I was saying. Um, I really think that we all need to take a step back and understand that everything we do is so iterative. I mean, the business of media is iterative. Our first draft is never our final draft. Um, and you know, that's kind of the cool thing about what we do too, is we always get a second chance. You know, we get rejected at one journal, we go to the next, okay. um, you know, and it's all part of the process, all part of the learning process. I and mean, I cannot tell you how many times I was up at 2 a.m. during my doc program, you know, crying because I can't figure out how to run a, you know, statistical something or another and just trying to figure it out, and, you know, Googling everywhere and looking up, you know, solutions and books. Um, but that was what built me into now I can do something. Um, and it's, you know, it's a process and just be patient, 
with the process because it's a long and daunting process. But keep smashing those roadblocks. We're all smashing the patriarchy. We can smash the roadblocks, right? Mm -hmm. um, you have a space to fill. You belong. And just keep pushing through. It'll be it'll be worth it in the end. And it's, re it's really hard, but you know, Nike, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I would also say just one last thing is that, um, you know, we really need for men to come alongside us and normalize um, what we are um, experiencing as women. And we also need to make sure that we are yeah. not um, when I say that, what I mean is take paternity leave, show us your children in, you know, um, in the Zoom meetings, um, tell us you can't make it to a meeting because you have a child care responsibility. These things help normalize it for women as well. Erin Whiteside, at, um, she's an associate professor at Tennessee, she says this stuff so wonderfully and eloquently. Um, whenever she talks about gender issues in sport and, and in her work. So please pay attention to her when she speaks because she's awesome. Um, the other thing that I would want to say is, you know, there's a lot of people who talk about this, this proverbial pie and there's only so many slices to the pie. It's total crap. Don't listen to that. There's plenty of pie for everybody. We all deserve a piece of the pie. And, um, you know, comparison truly is the thief of joy. So, you know, look around you, the women you see around you, cheer them on, have them cheer you on. When you do something cool, ask them to help you celebrate. Um, you know, we really do need to come alongside each other and celebrate each other's wins and promote each other's work and, and do things like this right here. And, you know, where we can get together and commiserate about our imposter syndrome and, um, you know, just, talk about and normalize the things that we're all dealing with and we're all feeling. So, you know, find your squad, like everybody's been saying, um, and that should be made up of a lot of different people, not just, you know, this advisor or that mentor, but lots of people that you can talk to about a lot of different things. But for the most part, I would just leave it with it's an iterative process. We're all learning and growing as we go along and we all have a space to be in and to fill and we belong. You know, I'm not going to lie. I'm sitting here thinking, why don't we all just go get a glass of wine and continue this conversation? <laughs> um, so just to piggyback on something that you all have said, I think, um, you know, we do have the good fortune as academics to go to conferences, not this year really at all. Um, but in the past, we've done so, and we're going to be optimistic and hope that we will do it in the future. And, you know, sometimes we're in, when we're in cool places like San Francisco, where AJMC would have been, or Australia, where ICA would have been, it's so easy to get sidetracked by where we are. Um, but I've always tried to, um, and I don't want to use the word force because it's too strong of a word, but I've um, highlighted things in the program. People that I want to go here um, that do work in my area because it's just like this conversation, it's inspiring. I mean, you all are inspiring. And I leave conferences feeling motivated and inspired. And I'm thinking about research problems in new ways or different theoretical approaches. And I mean, I have, I mean, that's why I still like have November 1 and April 1 deadlines on my calendar for anything because it's like, this will get me there and that will put me in a space where I can be inspired because maybe, you know, I'm overwhelmed with administration and or whatever else is going on in life. But being able to hear from people like the five of you, you know, now I'm just like, I'm going to get my wine. I'm going to work out a new research program. And that's, you know, that's how I'm walking away from this. So definitely um, take advantage of the opportunity we have to go to conferences and hear fabulous women talk about their research because how could you not be inspired um 
it has been so wonderful to speak with you. And I have to say, I'm very honored that Andy asked me to, you know, rally up this, this panel because you five are amazing. And I just want to say thank you for your time. Thank you for contributing to this panel discussion. And I truly hope that we can continue this, um, not only via Zoom, but getting together at conferences in the future. So thank you all so, so much.